Hello, podcast listeners. My name is Kelly Richardson Lawson. I'm a mother, a wife, and an entrepreneur. I started the Sunrise Project after our beautiful teenage son attempted to take his own life. Truth is, I'm tired. My husband and I felt despair, isolation, and immeasurable pain. I knew in my heart we needed a place for Black parents to share their struggles, find mutual support, and help our beloved children who struggle with mental wellness, addiction, or both. Each weekly podcast features an expert who shares their knowledge and takes questions from parents and children. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. The Sunrise Project allows Black families, like ours, to find comfort in knowing that we are not alone. While the purpose of the Sunrise Project is to share, support, and uplift, this conversation is not a substitute for medical advice. Finding the right healthcare professional for your family's specific needs is crucial. If you do not feel seen or heard, you should speak to more than one professional to find the right fit. Welcome to our weekly Sunrise Project call. And as always, I am really happy and grateful that you're all here and that we are all here to find a moment of solace and peace and gratitude, which is our topic this morning, as we share and learn from one another in a safe space filled with love, compassion, and a mutual desire to heal our children, ourselves, and our families. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. This morning, Sylvia High is back with us, and I am so delighted that she's here. This morning's topic is gratitude and being grateful and finding a grateful heart despite it all. And so I'm going to turn it over to Sylvia to get us started. Thank you again for being here this morning. I really appreciate it, Sylvia. It's an honor to be here this morning. Good morning, everyone. That's one of the things, gratitude be one of my favorite, a distinction, because I, I work inside of distinctions, and the more that we can distinguish ourselves inside of a circumstance or situation, the more power we have in the situation. And so um, just distinguishing for ourselves when we are feeling ourselves in some pretty tough spots and uh, finding our way to gratitude will give us access to freedom that minus the gratitude, it will not. At the very least, gratitude gives us access to uh, breath and relief, sometimes momentarily, depending on the magnitude of what you're dealing with. And as a lifestyle, it can keep us elevated above the situation. All of us have heard the old saying, our attitude determines our altitude. Well, what I have found in my own life, that gratitude will is the greatest elevator. It lifts my attitude uh, in some of the most challenging times. And to, as you all know, um, it's tougher in times of challenge when things are not going well or not going our way or we're up against some challenging times to really, you have to, I have found, I have to dig deeper and harder for the gratitude or to have a perspective of gratitude. But when I go for it and I'm willing to dig for it and push to get it, I get and we get, and it's been studies have shown, people get a certain amount of relief and elevation above what's going on. Now, the thing is, usually you can get profound freedom. However, when you're dealing with a difficult challenge like your children, your children is not just an aspect of your life. So, you know, let's say if you lost a job, That's an aspect of your life, so you got all of these other aspects that you can easily access most times to get some gratitude, right? 
if you know you're going through a hard time, even if you break up with the mate, if you there's all these other things that when we're having challenges in those types of things of our lives, we can access gratitude easier because it's an aspect, our job, our finances, you know, gaining weight, you name it. It's a million things that oftentimes we are facing that is unsettling, overwhelming, disappointing, but it's certainly just an aspect of our lives. So therefore, gratitude is a lot easier to implement. However, when we're dealing with our children, they're part of every aspect of our life. You know, they are intertwined. There's nothing that they're not a part of in your psyche, in your emotion. So it's much more difficult, this conversation of gratitude, when we're dealing with uh, loved ones and especially our children because they are indeed, in most cases, the biggest part of our lives. So having said that, I know that this conversation isn't necessarily, or this distinction of gratitude, isn't necessarily the easiest one to implement when we're up against it, you know, because our children impact our own well-being mentally, emotionally, and uh, we often must find ourselves when we're challenged with our kids having challenges of all kinds. We're saddled by their conditions of your children, we find ourselves burdened, the experience of powerlessness. You can't do anything. They, You can't make them make the choices you want them to make. It creates a certain amount of fear, find ourselves afraid. I know that so often parents are, feel a sense of shame and guilt when their children are not going the straight, narrow, successful, ideal route and a sense of inadequateness. Where did I fail? might even be feeling a bit like a failure, embarrassed. And in some cases, depending on what the circumstance is with the child, indeed terrified. And having said that and know that, I still know that gratitude is a way to experience some freedom in those times that and in those things that are confining and constricting. The practice of gratitude does not negate in any way, shape, or form the situation, the magnitude of it, but it gives us access to a sense of freedom, empowerment, and breath. And again, depending on what's going on, um, it may last only five minutes, you know, But if we can learn to get a hold of gratitude as a lifestyle, it becomes a powerful key to our freedom. And it is hard. I never will forget. I can think of so many different circumstances in my own life when gratitude was the thing that pulled me out of the pit. One was I've been in love twice, one with my husband that I'm married to and then my college fiancé. And just about a few months before we were to get married, he was murdered, and I witnessed the murder. Needless to say, I was beyond mm, overwhelmed, traumatized, and really, you know, literally wanted to get in the casket, so to speak, like literally at 20, I was 25 years old. It was it a was very dark, dark, dark time in my life. And my mother, who loves me very deeply, of course, she flew to Pittsburgh and was by my side for a while, just was with me there. And uh, so she saw me spiraling down very far. And uh, I shall never forget it. She looked at me in my eyes and she said, you know, Mama is so sorry that this has happened to you. I really am. And then she says, but listen, I've given your father three children. I ran his bath water, shined his shoes. You all went to school every day with fresh squeezed orange juice, grapefruit juice, and I cooked all his meals. And I have never, ever been loved the way you've been loved. Consider yourself blessed. 
And, oh, my God, it never even occurred to me that everybody hadn't experienced that kind of love. So it was in that moment that I began to reinterpret. And I talked to you guys about an intentional interpretation, and I think this is the story I shared with you before. I had to dig deep, but I began to say, well, thank God I've been loved. Wow, thank God I wasn't shot. Thank God, and I began to gratitude my way out of this through an intentional interpretation of the situation. wasn't easy. It took me five years before I went on the next date. But in that moment, from that moment that I was able to access the gratitude, I felt like I could breathe again, and I could keep making that one step in front of the other. And for some moments, it was just that moment that the gratitude gave me, and I had to do it over and over again. Now I live from a state of gratitude, and it certainly has supported me. I'll think another time when I was jolted in a way that uh, has come to be a life lesson, but it wasn't comfortable at the time. One of my dear, dear friends, I used to work in New York. Every four weeks I would fly to New York to do a training that I do. And I stay with my girlfriend when I'm there. And I had had this really amazing deal come through for me. And I shall never forget, I was so excited and just telling her all about how great it was and this big new project and how good God is and God is good and God is good and just thrilled. I can't even reenact the level of passion and excitement I had. And she looked at me and she said, well, Sylvia, if God is good, God is good, period. Not just when things are going your way, not just when you are happy, not just when he's doing what you want him to do. So I felt like she was a negative Nancy and had rained on my parade. But I came to use that and to stand in that place and had to use it pretty shortly that at, at thereafter, a year or two later, she passed away uh, very quickly from pancreatic cancer. And that is when that thought came back to me. Is God good now? And it was harder. But I had to then reflect she's only 52 years old. She was at the height of her career. Her business was thriving. Needless to say, I was completely devastated. And this is like one of my best friends who I lived with every four weeks for 17 years. I would fly to New York and stay with her for a week. We worked in partnership in the business of transformation. And I had to use intentional interpretation because my first interpretation, this is horrendous. How could this happen? She's only 52 years old. She's, you know, given to society on and on and on, and I was just furious that, um, you know, her life was so short. And from an intentional interpretation of gratitude, I began to thank God for how she impacted the world in 52 years, that she had actually been around the world and seen the world, that she, we together had changed hundreds of thousands of people's lives, and I had known a sister friendship like never before. And that took work over and over again, but it began to give breath. And literally, I couldn't be in that moment when you're choosing gratitude. The sadness can't coexist at the same time. So it's even just for that breath sometimes that you need. And then if we can use it as a way of life, then our lives have a particular texture. And um, understanding when it's our children, they impact every single aspect of our being and it's much more difficult to do. So um, I have three ways. It's easier said, but what I have found that I've had to do in those moments when it's not readily available to me, I have to choose the spirit of willingness. So that's the first step is to be willing to choose the gratitude in the face of the pain. 
Willing is a very benign word, and I might have even talked about that with you all the last time. But minus willingness, it will not change. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to let go the pain in the moment, the position in the moment, the disappointment in the moment, the overwhelm in the moment, to choose gratitude in that moment. So it's a willingness is step one. The second step is the one that I just talked about, is actually making the choice to intentionally interpret your situation that will give you access to power and empowerment. And when I say that, that is not the same as, you know how people just um, do a little motivational, lightweight, make myself feel better, tell a lie that you're not overwhelmed, that you're not shamed, you're not embarrassed, you don't feel afraid. It's not pretending at all that what you're experiencing isn't there. You acknowledge indeed what you're experiencing Tell yourself the truth. I'm overwhelmed right now. I am angry. I'm disappointed beyond measure. So acknowledging that and then making a conscious choice to find an interpretation that will give you access to gratitude in those heightened moments of pain. And the third step is uh, also an intentional component of choosing our ability to respond. We call it responsibility, but not responsibility the way most of us think about it around duty and obligation, but using our power and ability to respond and how we're going to respond. And um, those are three of the key steps that gives us the how to use gratitude in times of immense pain, confusion, hurt, and you'll have to push past. I know I have my flesh, so to speak, my anger, my position, my yeah, but. Yeah, but you don't understand. Yeah, but how am I supposed to do that? Yeah, but you, you this has been going on for so long. This is my child. All of our yeah, but, that's where that willingness. Yeah, but that is true. And this too shall pass like that and stepping into it and stepping into it and stepping into it. And, you know, gratitude and faith are first cousins, is the way I like to say it. And um, really not looking at what is, because what is, if your kid is in the height of an addiction or a mental breakdown, you know, looking at the reality can take all hope from us. And that's where our faith, seeing things, that are to come, not as they are, but as you will have them be, and visualizing it. And uh, if I, you know, one of the things that I, uh, my minister preached some years ago, and he said, have what you say, don't say what you have. And I know I probably shared that one because I live by that one. So when life is in the toilet, you're not going to say life is in the toilet. You're going to say, you know what, it's getting better. I'm prosperous. Call a friend. Find someone that can support you in this that you feel safe and not judged and and criticized by so that you can have a different level of strength than if you're trying to go on your own. I have a tool that I use called my self-locator. I have to locate myself in the middle of situations. Am I angry? Am I hurt? Am I intimidated? Am I afraid? i got to check in and see what's going on with different situations at times. So, Kelly, I'll send this to you all, and if you could send it out to everybody later, because it's going to be hard for you all to completely visualize this graph, but it's a tool. Okay. And if you could think of an eight, let's just look at a sheet of paper, if everybody will visualize with me, that we got a sheet of paper, let's say eight by ten, and you got one, two, three, four, five columns, you know, vertical columns. And the first column says facts. That's the title. So I use this as an example. And you could put your child in this one. Um, COVID-19 is killing thousands of people and the economy is a wreck. That's the first column. Second column is belief. This will never end. 
I will never recover. I'm going to lose everything I have. Let's say that's a belief. The feeling, afraid, overwhelmed, angry. Then the, that's the third column is feeling. So it's first column is facts. Second column is beliefs. Third column is your feeling. Then the fourth column is the intentional interpretation. The economy has recovered many times from uh, economic fall. Uh, this is not the first time that the world has seen a pandemic. We shall overcome. Action is the last step. I'm going to meditate, pray, journal, exercise, get a therapist, call a friend, do my affirmations, whatever the actions are that will support you to access power and empowerment. It cannot be passive. Radical situations require radical actions. And so for you as parents, these are radical situations. It's going to require radical, consistent actions that will keep you powerful and empowered. You can't ease up because your children are an aspect of your life 24-7, right? And the moment we ease up on the things that's going to keep us mentally and emotionally whole, when you look up, you're in the black hole trying to crawl back out. Life will come at you so fast that you'll feel that you don't have time to do the self-care, and I'm saying you can't afford not to do the self-care. And for me, mine is my gratitude journal every morning, every night. It's my prayer. Uh, When I'm in a really tough, stinky one, I will visualize, you know, my future, the irresistible future that – will have me stay inspired to get up over and over again. So I want to stop for a moment, and and let's just have some dialogue, have you guys ask some questions. And then I think what would be great if any of you would share some of your best practices that you've used to access gratitude or to be able to breathe or to reframe so that you've been able to continue in some of your tougher, tougher moments. So I would I would love that if we could just ask questions. If you have questions of me, one and two, any um, things that you have that you can share with one another. Any thoughts? Does anybody want to share? Good morning. This is Sharon. Hi, Sylvia. Hi. I wanted to um, just say thank you for the reminder of um, being in gratitude. It's been a a long four years for all of us, um, emotionally, spiritually, financially. And for me, what has been the tool has been laughter and just finding always the joy. And, um, you know, it's just (laughs) hilarious for me that as we look at the pain of our children, um, as we're in unison on this call about mental health, you know, there are some really funny times that happen um, for us as parents, as we are struggling in the midst of the psychosis or the down and just, you know, we're in tears, we're frightened for their life, the choices that they're making. And I just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, we, we have to find the joy in it. We have to find the truth in it. And a a funny story for me is um, my son was in major psychosis, and we were on our way, and this is uh, three weeks ago. We're on our way to the hospital, and we're in the elevator, and there's this older white man in the elevator. And I'm rubbing my son's back and just, you know, praying that he didn't jump off and, you know, act a fool. And, of course, he did because I thought it, right? And he starts screaming, I know what the problem is. I'm a white man, and they can't see it. They just see me as a black man, and they don't understand that I'm white, and I'm better than all of them. And there's this older white man in the elevator. And I just start cracking up. 
And then he turns his head and puts it down. And the situation jumps out the elevator. I found a solution. And I was like, O-M-G. All I could do was laugh. There was nothing I could do. And so later on, I tell him what he did. And he was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I hope I see that man again and tell him I'm sorry. And then the other side of me was like, no. Some, he had been so beautiful in the process. And one of the things he said to me was, when, when black males are in mania and in psychosis, they incarcerate us, they institutionalize us. But when white men are in mania, they create Apple, they create Tesla, they create Microsoft. And so there was some truth mm-hmm. in it. And so all I had to do was laugh. So I just wanted to share with you all. I know that um, what Sylvia says is true of feeling the gratitude and letting go. And for me, it's about laughter. Oh, wow. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> I'd laugh it now. <laughs> it was like I could just see it. And you know what? He was fine. The child is fine. You're the one. The parent is the one that's suffering, right? They're not fine. Exactly. <laughs> but their experience of themselves is that they're fine, right? Oh, my God. Thank you for that. And laughter is that. And there's so many, so much research that has shown uh, spontaneous healing from physical diseases, cancer, and et cetera, et cetera, before people that really intentionally look to laughter. Uh, and I wrote down when you were saying that find the beauty in the midst of the pain, like, you know, your child, the person, not the addiction. And if we can keep separating the mental illness from the and the addiction from the person, then that will give you greater access because they're in there somewhere, right? But right uh-huh. now they're just overtaken by the mental breakdowns that they're having or the addiction that has to hold on them. It's a spiritual warfare for your spirit, for their spirit. And, yeah, another thing that I have found, Sharon, I'm glad you shared this that came up for me, is asking myself the right questions in the middle of challenging times. You know, oh, my God, why is this happening to me? I mean, that's not a horrendous question, but it will give us most times access to more overwhelm, self-pity, anger, frustration. Not the best question in the midst of pain. I try to ask life lesson questions when I'm up against tough times. You know, what am I supposed to learn from this? What is this here to teach me? Like that, right? And... um separating the person, your child, from the disease. I think as much as we can do that, we'll be able to continue to see the beauty in them um, versus the disease overtaken. And then staying inside of the truth around their capacity. Like if they're in the middle of a psychosis, their capacity, not having a higher expectation. We wouldn't expect a second grader to do 11th grade math. We just wouldn't because they don't have the capacity. So we can't expect an addict to just set themselves free and keep their word and live in integrity or someone with a psychosis to have a clear mind and have a clear conversation. And I think there's a difference between hope which you want to stay hopeful and stand grounded in the reality of what is happening at, around your child's capacity, you know, the fact that it's a disease, they're separate from the disease, like that, when we can keep discerning through and navigating the mind so that way, I think that also gives us access to a certain level of empowerment, if you will, that we won't have when we collapse it all together. So anybody else have a question or a, a practice that you've used to support you in these times that we might, might all can benefit from? Hello. Um, I'm really thankful for Sylvia because the how to use gratification during these times of intense pain, it's just been extremely helpful because um, as I was thinking about the activity that you were talking about as far as really focusing on what are the facts, beliefs, feelings, and, and, and intentional interpretation, I had been processing it myself in just really thinking about how 
all of us are entering different conversations and where we are, you know, in me checking where am I in the physical point of view, you know, am I well rested? Am I, what's causing, what physically, did I eat well? Mm. Did I take my medication? Where am I as far as the, you know, health? Cause I, I, I realize that, you know, I ruminate or um, not, don't think my best self if I am not sleeping well or not taking care of myself physically and, um, and, and realizing, well, when's the last time I had a massage? What am I doing? Basically doing the wellness piece and then figuring out dipsticking and where am I on the emotional piece? And that has been a lot because, you know, there's just, where am I as far as humility? Am I making my challenge with, the psychosis or the challenge of where they are about me you know am I thinking like what am I doing the oh my god what is going on you know really I started asking myself why not me like why why would I think that I should not go through this and Mm -hmm. it makes me so special that you know I can't figure out how to do this when there's so many people may not even have access to adequate health care or mental health right to mm-hmm. see what do I need to do um, to really address that and then really it's the spiritual piece that I've been you know having to do and I really wasn't doing that piece and, it, and it's funny because I pray all the time so it wasn't that it's really the spiritual piece of quieting myself and really doing more more yoga and really doing more service because I started, I was having difficulty expressing the gratitude. I could pray about it, but sometimes the prayer is a little bit less, um, you know, there's a way that you can pray and you're asking for prayers. And then I had to be really frank and saying, or it really is, am I kind of like complaining, like, dear God, give me the strength for this. Dear God, give me strength for that. And, mm-hmm trying to dig deeper into what am I praying how am I praying and how is my how are my prayers being more of um, realistic and timely what part of my prayers are really going about me recovering whatever my own ailments are or how my own ailments are impacting my children or whatever Mm -hmm. I push on them whether, you know, what, what learned behaviors or learned cultural mores or family mores have I pushed that really aren't working um, and regrouping with that. So that has been, and of course that pushes me on that intellectual part to go like, good God, what else can I feed myself to help me, to help me, you know, the, the intellectual part of me really process this. And so I've been doing a lot more reading and participating a lot more in Sunrise. And I actually bought Sylvia's book on the big book of questions, which is just so, ugh. It's just so, makes you so reflective. That is just, just so you know, it's just, it really does make me race through all the aspects of it. And it makes you feel like I got so much work to do. Let me just be more patient with my kid. So, mm-hmm. so I just really appreciate that because in trying to figure out how to fix, I guess I realized I was trying to fix a permanent problem with temporary solutions. So your points on how to, you know, respond intentionally just really resonated with me. So I thank you for that. You're very welcome. Thank you. And something you said that I thought was very powerful. Sometimes we're complaining in the disguise of a prayer. So we want to notice, are we complaining or are we praying? And and when you can get to, like, just pure prayer and cry out to God. I'm going to give you five other distinctions that it's a course I teach called a master's course. And it's a mind stretch. I couldn't stand the course when I was a student, but I grew to learn the con- I love the content. And one of the first things that a master is taught to do is to experience the experience. So whatever's going on, experience the experience. If you're afraid, experience the experience. If you're sad, experience the experience, whatever that is. And then communicate your experience. That's the second step, is to communicate your experience 
with the intent of others getting it. Girl, I'm overwhelmed. I'm afraid. You know what? I found some peace. Whatever it is, but communicate the experience with with the intent of others getting it. That's the second step. The third is to have what you have. Not settle, not give up, not become hopeless. That's not what this means at all. But have what you have. Like be where you are because a sure shot of taking you into a dark hole is to be wishing, you know, you're in 15 minus 15 degree weather and you're wishing for 85 degrees with sun, right? You got a kid that is troubled just trying to keep their thoughts together and you want, you're thinking about them going to an Ivy League school. No, no. You haven't given up, but have what you have. This is what I have right now. Um, And the willingness of what you talked about just a moment ago is the willingness to be responsible for everything. That is not blame. That's not blame, making yourself wrong. But if we will be responsible for everything, that puts us in a power seat that we don't have access to if we're not willing to be responsible. Not blame, not fault, none of that just a willingness to be responsible for everything. Wishing and hoping is not our friend. The other thing that uh, you triggered in your conversation with me is that we must annihilate the judge, the self-loather, and the critic in ourselves. And they're going to steady talk. you know. And the mind is a pig. The mind is a pig. It will eat Anything you feed it, and I say this a lot, especially to myself and to folks that are going through. And so you got to be an observer of your mind and your thoughts. You are not one with your thoughts. You are authoring everything that you're thinking about the situation. And when you can really be radical about strengthening these spiritual and mental muscles, because that's what they are, And with radical situations, we need radical action so that you can stay senior to the situation. That's one thing that I do love about gratitude. You will find an ounce of sweetness in the bitter. It will elevate you above the situation. So, um, yeah, an intentional focus because what we focus on becomes the biggest. You know, what we nourish, flourish. So that that's really what I'll say. And keep separating your child from the disease so that you can see that um, silver lining in the middle of the dark when it's tough is what I would offer there. Thank you so much. Mm, you're welcome. Hi, um, I just wanted to share some things that have helped me. I don't, I have not talked about this publicly, but I lost my husband uh, to suicide about a year and a half ago. And needless to say, it has been the most horrific time of my life. These calls have really saved my life, so I wanted to share some of the strategies I've used because I think as mothers, when in a time of crisis, sometimes you can find a way to scrap up enough energy to save your children or help your children. What I didn't realize is that his death almost killed me, and I was able to put enough, put enough energy into realizing how desperately clinically depressed my kids were and do anything I could to help them, including including getting a psychiatrist and a psychologist to come to the house to meet with them because I couldn't get the energy to drive and to get them the medication they needed and, you know, take care of their medical needs. But I was just taking care of the basics, just enough to survive. And one of the positive unintended consequences of COVID and the schools going 100% virtual is that I was forced to stop hiding. I literally would drive my kids to school in in my pajamas, drop them off, come home, shut my blackout curtains, stay in my bed until it was time to pick them up from school, pick them up from school, order DoorDash for dinner, get back in bed. 
with COVID, I couldn't hide from them anymore. And it, it opened up a door to make me realize that their depression was not just losing my husband, but seeing their mother barely surviving. So I started grief counseling for myself. I got medication for myself, but I also, I started um, a gratitude journal. I bought gratitude journals for me and the kids that we write in every day and every morning, and we do it as a group exercise. Um, I bought these cards that I would implore everybody to buy that I saw on um, Jada Pinkett Smith's Red Table Talk. There are these cards that you can buy where you ask questions of one another on a much deeper level, and you get to know your family members in a way that you had never contemplated before. Um, and it's just, it's been magic for our family. And, um, and most importantly, I've sort of rewired the way I think about life and the universe. And I think to myself, if we assume that before we are born on this earth plane, that we've decided, like, here are the lessons I want to learn in this life as a spiritual being on earth, why would I have selected him? Why would I have selected this? What is it that God wants me to learn? What is it I want it to learn? What does the universe want me to learn? And what are all of the really good things that happened as opposed to why me? You know, how could this happen to us? And we've actually been able to really find a lot of wonderful things that now allow us to laugh and celebrate his life and celebrate our lives and, um, and move forward. And I, and that last part, like, what am I supposed to learn, um, has been a saving grace for us. And I wanted to share that in case it helps anybody else. And also I just felt it was very important to share that until COVID, I had no idea that my appearance and my inability to function at more than a basic level was making things even worse for my kids. They were terrified that they were going to end up with no parent. Mm. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. That was so rich. Uh, wow, and very inspiring and very uh, a reinforcement of what I, I, I believe to the depths of my being. I wrote a book. Uh, I'm glad to hear that Jada and those guys have that same, uh, some some version of that going. My first book is called The Little Book of Big Questions, A Journey in Self-Discovery. And I know that it was the high-yielding questions that I have asked myself throughout the tougher times in my life that has given me uh, access to revelation, new information, and inspiration. I think why questions are the lower end. This time of COVID has been the first time I've ever find, found a why question to be high yielding. And to your point, when COVID hit in March, I was in New York after I panicked and figured out how to get back home. I landed, and on my first walk, I walk five days a week, um, I ask myself, why is this here? Mm -hmm. this time in the world? Why is COVID in the world at this time? What is it asking of the world, and what is COVID asking of me? Yes. And that turned my business, which was 99% live trainings, into a digital platform in no time. And a lot of people went to digital out of desperation, but people have been asking me for years, why don't you do more stuff online so more people could get to you? And I had a whole story and excuse about it. But that one question of what did it come to teach me and what is it asking of me gave me access to power and creativity and innovation that I wouldn't have had minus asking the right questions. So I would highly recommend, I haven't, I've heard about the Jada questions, but I would invite you guys to get that. And my book definitely will give you some time for personal reflection with those questions. Here's the thing. I asked my friend that I was walking with when COVID first hit, first week of it, I said, let's declare right now, if I don't author COVID 
COVID is going to author me. If you don't author your challenges with your children, with your business, with your life, with your marriage, with your health, you know, i got a friend right now going through um, breast cancer, and we've authored this journey for her already, and it's been amazing. Of course she wouldn't choose it at some level. She may have if we go really on a deep, deep spiritual level around it, but Another thing that came up for me is that when we're in doubt, the way I like to say it is when you're in doubt, focus on, which is how Sunrise Program came about. Kelly was going through her own personal pain, and she used it and focused out, and now it's a healing bomb for many people. And that is, I believe, so much of what we go through is not just for us, it's for others. So you just never know who needs to hear your story and how your story, your piece of wisdom can give somebody else the courage to continue. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that was really helpful. I just wanted to say, this is Kelly. This has been right on time for me. Um, It's okay. um, One of the things you said about... (laughs) Realizing that your child is not your child. It's the addiction. It's been a really tough week. And we thought he was on a better path. And this we realized this week he's not. And we were trying to get him to come back to school yesterday in Atlanta. And my husband and I were on our way to the airport. And he had a light jumped out the car. And when I realized, finally, after going through this for um, basically the three years is that it's the demon of addiction. Mm-hmm. It's not my, he's not my child anymore. And he's such a beautiful child, but right now it's a demon. And it's so painful. Um, and so as you talk, Sylvia, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for my other son, I'm grateful for my friends who are such a safety net for me. I'm grateful for my tribe. I'm grateful for my faith. That's what's getting me through. And what you said that just really struck home for me and uh, is being clear that the lack of integrity, the lack of, you know, anything, any desire to be with his family is not him. And so I have to hold on to that and hold on to the, it's the addiction that has taken over and being uh, strong enough to have radical action mm-hmm. and being strong enough to, you know, stand with my husband and not let him in anymore. That's going to be really hard, mm-hmm. but I am grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for everybody on this call and so many of my friends and I'm just grateful I have faith because that's what's keeping me right now. And I'm grateful for you, Sylvia. So thank you. Thank Thank you, you, Kelly. Kelly. And I'm grateful that you created this space. I'm grateful for your courage. I'm grateful for your freedom to tell your truth because it's one thing to have this to deal with and then have to mask. And hold all of that, too, you know, so there's freedom in your truth. So I'm going to just invite you as we close you all uh, today, and then Kelly will close with the prayer, is to just continue to uh, annihilate that self-loather, the self-critic, and the self-judge that would, you know, have you not own your own humanity, and to give yourself the gift of grace. And thank you all for allowing me and trusting me to have the conversation with you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, Beautiful as always. I'm going to go ahead and close out today with the prayer. Mm -hmm. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together on our Sunday sunrise call today. We thank you, God, for Sylvia High and her beautiful heart. We thank you for the privilege of being parents and caregivers. We thank you for this safe space 
to be able to be transparent with one another. Father God, we acknowledge our pain this morning. Many of us are experiencing significant trials and tribulations in our homes with our children and our loved ones. In many cases, it feels like it's too much to bear, and we acknowledge the pain today. Yet we stand here having done all. We stand and we say, Lord, you are good, and your mercy endureth forever. You are good, period. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Today we choose to respond differently, and we ask for your strength as we make that shift. We place our burdens before you, and we choose to have faith. Faith meaning we don't know the outcome, but we choose to see a hopeful outcome as we put our trust in you. As we make this shift, God, please whisper to us the points of gratitude that we may not see in our current situation. We choose to find the moments of thankfulness and ask you to reveal those moments as we lift our eyes upward to the hills from which cometh our help. Finally, we choose not to operate out of fear. We know that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Give us courage along our journey today and in the days to come. As you said in your word, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So we thank you, God, for your loving kindness and your mercy and the many blessings we believe are in store. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, for joining us today on the call, and have a blessed day. Have a blessed day. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm Kelly Richardson Lawson, and you've been listening to the Sunrise Project podcast. You can follow Sunrise wherever you listen to podcasts. If you haven't yet, open your podcast app and follow this show. Join us next week for another gathering of support. Thank you for listening. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental wellness challenges, contact your doctor, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or both. You can reach NAMI's helpline at 800-950-6264, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time or email at info at nami.org. Volunteers are working to answer questions, offer support, and provide practical next steps.